So we're moving on now. We're on to council initiated discussion. Again, for the new council members, this is where we, we've been driving the agenda here and now we're gonna turn the microphones over to you and ask you, are there presentations or reports that you would like to see at future council meetings? Are there concerns that you're hearing from other investigators? We regard you as the representatives of the extramural community. Are there issues that you'd like to bring to our attention? In other words, this is an open mic to Pretty the much. open session, but it's an open mic in the open session. We want to hear from you. We do want to hear particularly if there are things you'd like us to bring to a future council meeting. Um, it's pretty obvious we will want to continue to bring through, time permitting, the new institute directors. Obviously, you know, how soon to get them here depends upon their arrival. We have a new cancer institute director clearly here. You know, there'll be others. I am sure once ARPA-H gets its leader in place, every council will want to have ARPA-H represent, you know, either the leader or somebody. So, I mean, I, I know the obvious ones to be thinking about, um, but we want to know others that either we're, we're not thinking of or that you really think is a high priority. Nancy Cox. Thank you. So um, this is something that came up during some of the NHGRI strategic planning, the need to educate medical center lawyers and leadership on not just the the risks of data sharing, but the risks of not data sharing. And a few of us could really use some additional talking points um, with the new um, plans on data sharing. There's just, there's a lot of education to do um, of the people most concerned about the legal consequences of large scale data sharing. And I, I I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, we, we have our own plans for trying to educate more of the lawyers and the leadership in some of these spaces. But I do think that um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a bad thing for NHGRI to, to put together some simple talking points for, for the non-scientists to understand why it is so critical to be sharing more of the data, more of the time than we have been, even with what have been pretty aggressive data sharing plans within in genomics for, for some time now. It, it's a, it's such a, risk is such a, big deal to, um, to medical centers. And, and the truth is that a lot of the secure, the real security issues at hospitals are, it all comes back to financial concerns and a lot of the attacks on hospital computing security is to get at the financial information that is housed, not the health information that is housed in these places. But but making sure that they're weighing the modest risks associated with sharing data from the privacy perspective against the, the huge loss to science for failing to share, and, and not just to, to science and therefore to our patients' long-term well-being, we, we, we have to fight that battle and it's, um, I don't know. It, I've had a few people ask whether there's going to be anything forthcoming from NIH, not targeting the scientists, but rather the legal entities and the, the leadership who are not, by and large, geneticists. So, so, Nancy, thank you for that comment, which I think is a very good one, and it's the kind of input I really like to get. But let me press you on what you're really asking. And I'll, and I'll just be really frank with you that we're at an interesting inflection point. You know, for a long time, the focus about data, or the heavy focus about data sharing was genomic data, because we had the genomic data sharing policy. Yes, there was stuff with clinical trials. That was sort of on a different trajectory. But for a while, therefore, since it was the NIH's genomic data sharing policy, all eyes went to us because we were the intellectual leaders, and it was all our fault in a good way. 
Okay, but now with the new data sharing and management plan, everything has been a, a much broader discussion around data sharing and data management, which takes the focus away from genomics, but even though genomics remains a bit of a poster child, but it, 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 what you're asking for, I'm gonna press you now is do, and I know your answer is going to be both, but I'm going to press you that we can't do it. You know, do these lawyers and hospital leaders and medical center leaders need to know about the value of genomic data? Do they need to know really about the value of all data sharing, including electronic health record or you know, any kind of data? And if, if that's the, and so you're going to say, of course, both is important. But I actually think a broader, we don't want to pick the battle just for genomic data and then find barriers with any other type of data. In which case, I think we should be helping, and maybe that's what we could do, but I don't, I'm not sure we should be leading, because I also don't want folks to think that what we're mostly talking about is genomic data. I would rather just it be data. And so maybe what I'm, ask, maybe what I'm hearing from you, Nancy, if I can do some friendly amendments, is maybe what you're asking is we should be pushing harder at the NIH level to develop sort of a trans-NIH effort to educate the lawyers and the leadership. And I mean, take this feedback and try to generalize it around just data in general. Is that a fair way to approach I, it? I, it? Yes, the issue is, so the problem is that the scientists who deal with this are generally not the ones opposed to data sharing. Right. It is the yeah. people who manage risk for large medical centers see only risk in this sharing activity. They don't recognize the risk in failing to share the way that, that we do. And, and, and so the materials that generically help to explain the value of data sharing and the risk of not sharing the absolute risk to improved health long term for not sharing that's 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 the that's the part of it they don't see they they absolutely see the risk to the sharing part for um, the 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 potential loss of privacy to patients who use these hospitals but they they don't have any idea of the magnitude of risks incurred by failing to share these data long term in terms of the science that could be done if it were shared that won't be done if it's not shared. Nancy, are you convinced that it should be the government talking to these folks alone or, or you sort of envision a coalition of government leaders maybe coupled with a few folks from progressive institutions or medical centers or health systems where they've embraced this and realize that the sky's not falling? and have them help us as a coalition go around and try to you know, spread the word. I think, so I think leadership from places that have embraced sharing and why, why they've embraced sharing, those kinds of talking points would be probably the most effective. Okay, so I've got Joe and Olga and then Peter. Go ahead, Joe. Um. Yeah, I, I think I, Eric, I think this concept, and I've brought it up since I've been on the, the committee, I think I've brought it up every time, which is this concept of data privacy and what is NIH's role. And I sit on the boards of hospitals and I know what, Nancy, I understand your perspective on who manages the risk, but I think the world has changed and we've been asked, uh, Eric, to speak to various members at the NIH in counseling on the issue of data privacy, global data privacy, GDPR, CCPA, and all that kind of stuff. And I think to, I think it would be helpful if we took a balanced approach and the NIH could be, to your point, maybe a mediator in the middle because the risk is real of what Nancy said both ways. I think, and we have discovered this in our research, that you will find a lot of the underserved populations are not going to contribute their data because they don't trust 
researchers. And I hate to say that to a group of researchers, but it is absolutely true. So the risk isn't just that a hospital loses data or is financial. A lot of populations in underserved areas that we support and we see are unwilling to give their data because they don't trust research because research shares their data inappropriately without their permission across the globe. But we have instances of this. So I'm not saying that the NIH can solve it, but I think there's a biased, balanced approach to being able to share data ethically, legally with people and data privacy. And I, I think the NIH could take a role in educating people as to what those are. So I love the topic. I think it's a huge topic and I think we have the have to have the courage to take it on, but it is a very much a gray area. It's not just hospitals trying to mitigate risk to save money. It's people's lives, people's data, and our ability to support undiagnosed populations, diverse populations is absolutely based on trust. And trust is not held in many of these populations because of the sins of the past. And that's something we have to correct. And I think the NIH could play a huge role in that because you can take a middle ground in being an educator on both sides of the equation. So you know me, I've, I've said this every time and I'll, I'll keep on saying it. I think it's a major topic uh, that is going to slow us down but I think it has to be done well. And to your point, Nancy, we need people to share data. We want people to accelerate science, but we can't do it the way we've done it in the past. And I think the general population and people, individuals globally are saying they just don't want that to be the case anymore. So that's my, uh, my hope and my approach for something that we take on in the future. Okay, we've got Olga, then Peter, then Howard. Uh, I guess my comment is uh, somewhat related, but uh, a little bit different. So I really enjoyed uh, the presentations related to the human genome and the reference and really thinking about it in a much more diverse and careful way. Uh, and related, so I think that's incredibly powerful because obviously currently our reference references in pretty much all of, or the vast majority of the studies are really not well balanced to our cases and it's just, an incredible question, just even practically for essentially anything we do with uh, human population genetics uh, and clinical genetics. Uh, the question that I have is, uh, do we have or should NIH or especially really NHGRI think about some way of enabling um, a way to have a single resource where reprocessing of these variants could be done in a way to match the case, how the cases were processed in particular studies. It seems like a very technical point, but it's an important one, right? Because essentially you could end up with actually pretty major biases, even if you have a wonderful genomic reference that's, for example, even ethnically balanced to your cases, but if your calls are done separately and differently. Does that make sense? Maybe say a few more sentences to make sure I'm following. This, this, this sounds like a very, it does sound very specific to me. It's very specific, but it's something that I've heard from so many people that really basically, and it's really preventing a lot of groups who are not as big computational movers and shakers from being able to really do these genetic analyses, right? Because they don't really have a way to run their analyses because they, they don't have a good control. And all of these studies, essentially we're producing these whole genome controls that are going to be wonderful, but then actually we're putting a huge burden and repetitive burden on investigators to be able to reprocess this to actually, or else they don't reprocess and they don't realize that that's important and then you end up with some power analysis. Basically, I think we're, we could use a lot more thinking about how uh, all of these data are stored and shared and provided, uh, where you know the details will actually matter a lot in terms of how much impact it will have. I'm just trying to get a sense on whether that's a research project. Is that a, a, a research project, a resource augmentation of what we currently have, or is it more about policy and logistics? I don't think it's a research project. I think it's okay. a combination of resource and policy and logistics. There's a policy aspect to it to make sure yeah. that everything is actually shared, but I think it's largely really doing it right with the resource. I don't think there's a research yep. component. And, and do you, you know. is it the kind of thing that could be grafted onto the current reference program, or is this so large that it would need to be a whole separate program in and of itself? 
I don't you don't think have it to needs answer to be... it. I mean, our program staff who are responsible for that will I mean, I think that ponder, that's, that's but... something that the program staff can think okay. of. I mean, my guess is it will require more than money, and I think it requires some thinking of how to, because it's yep. computational, you know, it's a lot of cycles. It's non-trivial. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not non-trivial. Research-wise, it's not a research question, right? Because there are research projects that develop all these software, right? Like, then the question is, how do you enable it? And I think it's the programmatic question versus research question. Yep. Peter. Um, so I, I completely support what, what Nancy was proposing, but um, I'd, I'd like to maybe go into a little bit more depth. So, I mean, it seems like there are things that would be easy to improve and things that would be very hard to improve. And I'm not sure that NHGRI or even NIH has really done a good survey of all of the things that are wrong about the data landscape. As an example of something that might be easy to fix, uh, I'll, I'll mention SRA, and so if you're doing a bioinformatics research project, you might want to get all of the samples that have something to do with lung cancer or with, with COVID or, or whatever from SRA. This is actually pretty challenging. The, so that, that's something where I, I imagine if NIH were to pay curators and, and software engineers to improve that interface, that researchers all, all over the country would be able to get better data do more relevant and higher quality studies. So I think that would almost certainly pay for itself. The question of whether we can get hospitals to share data, that to me that sounds like that's more on the level of Congress than at, than at NIH. I don't know, but I mean, I'm wondering if it would just be good to have a, a workshop or, or some way of just gathering all of the things where, the, where people think that data is now hard to use and it would become easier to use if we made it fairer. So that's implementation and then there's policy that, that and I, I, don't, I don't really know. I think, I think it's, it basically includes almost everything that we do on a daily basis in, in bioinformatics and, and I, I personally believe that NIH should be spending about 10% more of its budget on, on data than it is now because this, this would just have an accelerator effect. I'm just thinking out loud. I don't know if anybody's going to know the answer. I know that when the data management and sharing policy was being contemplated, we put out an RFI and got a lot of community feedback. I just don't know if we asked questions that would directly answer. You know, we didn't say what were the big challenges. I mean, it was more like what, what were the challenges of sharing data as opposed to what were the big challenges that we're sort of now talking about with data being shared. I mean, that was, yeah, I answered, uh, I or sent some yeah. response, did many people, but that, that was very general. And just yeah, so actually, I don't think we have a catalog of things that sort of ranked according to how easy they would be yeah. to solve. To and if we had we that, could ask then the question we could say, different. okay, well, how much money do we have for this? And what are the, what are the low hanging fruits? Yeah, I mean, we could ask the questions very different now because we're in a different place. So, okay. Howard, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to bring up the issue that there might be uh, some sort of dynamics happening in our research workforce because at some recent meetings, at the end of nearly every talk, there's like an advertisement, really a plea for postdoc applicants. And this is especially be afflicting junior faculties. And so this might lead to a situation where grants are funded, but there's nobody to do the research and or uh, other kinds of issues. So just want to bring, um, bring that issue to the uh, uh, to attention of uh, NHGRI for discussion. So the question is, is there a national postdoc shortage? Is that, or, or is it well, just well, postdoc or postdocs and junior faculty or both? I think it's really a postdoc issue, which then might lead people to actually, instead of thinking about trainees, hire staff scientists to, to actually carry out their research or, um, uh, yeah, that's right. And, or maybe that, maybe grants are not, you know, the level of funding level is not competitive, the postdoc salary scale is not competitive with other options. And Howard, is it broad or is it computational biology or informatics? Is it limited to certain sectors or areas? Well, so you used to hear that issue more with computational scientists, but I see that now spreading into even other um, really biological, um, you know, molecular biology, uh, um, a lot more bio biological scientists. Okay, thank you. Any, anybody who can make antibodies doesn't even have to finish their PhD. <laughs> have others heard similar things or want to comment on postdoc? Yeah. Everybody's saying yes. 
Any, any hypotheses why that's the case? I mean, are we not letting people defend their theses and they're not getting out with their PhDs or they're going off and doing other things? We're competing with industry more so and industry, more. So it's the industry. Yeah. It's industry salaries and the perceived industry lifestyle. So <laughs> it's the weekend, getting the weekends back thing. Um, they, they think they'll have their weekends and a high salary if they go into industry and that they'll have neither if they stay in academia. Tim, you're going to speak to this point? Yeah, I think, I, I, I think we should let them tell us what the issues are. We should have the, po you know, the people, the postdocs. Yeah. Yeah. But do we hear? I mean, do we, you, you who are training postdoc or training graduate students and putting them out in the real world, what are you hearing about the, their decision making? You, I know what, what, you know, I have my own hypothesis. I'm hearing that students are older when they're starting graduate school, they're starting families during graduate school more often, and so they have much stronger financial constraints than there used to be. Um, I'm hearing competition for industry, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a myriad things, but, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I only hear yeah. a, a couple squeaks of what comes out, and I have a feeling there's a lot more that, that we could potentially dig into and learn if we opened up some um, avenues for voices to come through. I mean, I mean, and I will also say, you say you, you hear a small fraction of what's out there, and even if we took my entire genomics community, that's a teeny fraction of the NIH engine. I mean, we, every once in a while, we hear summaries at the, at the NIH level about these sorts of, of things. It's very interesting. So it's, it's useful to hear what we're hearing here and see if that parallels what we hear at the NIH level, because it, it may or may not, and there could be different forces, and it could be specific to what we need in our field. Like, it definitely goes beyond just genetics. It's yeah. postdocs across, across all fields. And the New York medical schools are all getting, they're voting to unionize uh, in overwhelming numbers. The UAW is kind of hitting. Unionize the postdocs. Yeah. And the rationale is to get higher salaries and to. Well, it also speaks to job dissatisfaction that we have to think a lot about. Yeah. You know, what industry is doing, what we're doing, because I am in that process, is. Uh, pay is escalating, so it's, you know, double digit kind of 10, 12, 15 percent increases. But the other pivot that is being made is almost all the jobs can be done remote now, unless it's a wet lab. And now wet labs are growing everywhere where you have companies building these micro wet labs in small cities and across the board. So it's a it's a combination of double digit salary increases, which we have to pay to get them now and enabling almost all jobs that are posted now are remote. And that's another pivot post COVID that we're starting to mm. take it well, for us. Industry is taking advantage of, and I think that's creating a gap in the workforce in other places. Boy, we thought the genome was a complicated place. This uh, <laughs> workforce ecosystem is gonna get us really complicated quick post pandemic. Yeah, Lynn. I think another factor is uh, funding insecurity. Uh, People yeah. think about, okay, doing a postdoc for three to five years, then perhaps getting a faculty position, scrambling for grants. One qu question I have in that, re in, in, in that regard is, how does the average length of an NHGRI R01 compare to that of other institutes? Because that's a complaint I've heard from some of our faculty. Who wants to stand up and who has the data or wants to summarize the discussion? I, don't, I think it has historically been shorter. We've been having more and more discussions about making it long. Oh, Betty, please come to a microphone. You want to come to mine, Betty? You're welcome to. Yeah. Or to Gail's. Uh, we just uh, developed our funding plan. Well, yeah, it's on. Just talk louder with the mask. We on. just developed our funding plan for this fiscal year, and we went with the option of the normal would be four years. In the past, it's been three, with very few exceptions of five. But this is not in stone. There are some grants that will be for five years, and we particularly look at new investigators. We try not to reduce them to four years if they have asked for five years, because we want to give them that opportunity to really be able to get their preliminary data so that they will be in a good position for their renewal. So that was very clear. The word is out that it's four years normal and five years with some exceptions. 
Thanks. Steve? On a slightly different topic, well, totally different topic. <laughs> um, you know, NCBI is supposedly an institute that has something to do with data and SRA and various things. But I have no clue where they're going or what they're doing. Um, so if we're thinking about, you know, bringing in another institute director, maybe the folks at NCBI would be a good one that could present and help us understand a bit more where they're going. I think they were supporting DBGAP, uh, and of course they're historically understaffed and well behind in getting things done, so. And um, they're hopefully at the, I was on the search committee, they're hopefully at the tail end of a search for a new director. So I don't, I don't think it would be productive to have folks come until we have a new director, but hopefully in the coming months, I was they'll be- it should a, be pretty soon. Oh, yes. So then I, I would hope, I don't know the details, of, okay. so I don't know anything yet, but I would certainly say when there's a new NCBI or when, when <laughs> NCBI gets a permanent director or, you know, the next full-time director, not acting director, I would absolutely want that person to come yeah. here. Okay. Good, good idea. Judy? Um, so this is my first meeting, so you may have had this already, but uh, gene therapy, uh, this is becoming a real reality. Um, so like kind of having some presentations in the future on that, um, I'm sure would be of great interest. I mean, sickle cell anemia, the data are looking fantastic. I mean, it's just, these are the victories of genetics. And um, Judy, you'd want this to sort of get a feel, I mean, so there are gene, there's lots of gene therapy going on across NIH, but truly across NIH, multiple places. There's, except for, we have essentially no gene therapy support from our extramural program, except now we've been putting our, we're putting our, our toes in the water just through this trans NIH bespoke gene therapy that we heard about earlier. Although in our intramural program, we have uh, some very active gene therapy activities. Is your interest in getting sort of a survey across what's going on at NIH? Or are you thinking something that might be more what NHGRI would potentially get? I'm just trying to yeah, understand. Just we're, we're NIH, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, so maybe yeah. that's why I'm so fascinated by yeah, it. So but like, how can you use genomic technologies? So it's easy to knock down, so TTR, you can knock down TTR, it's easy, you know what to do exactly. But all kinds of, what are the critical variables that NHGRI can lead on? Oh, that, so you wanna know things that we might be able to lead on? Or you, yeah. Which would lead to a discussion about is this something we should be leading right. on? Right. Because at the moment, it hasn't been anything we've invested in heavily yet extramurally. Right. Fair. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a huge topic. It is a huge topic. I mean, but yeah. There, so, there's some victories coming out. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine who we get, but we could, we'll, yeah. we'll ponder, we'll, stra we'll strategize of who it might be who could help set that up for us. Yeah, knockdown of late onset autosomal dominant gain of function mutations we can do. Like, what are the roles for this? And, I, you know, NHGRI maybe can lead on this. Okay. Mark? Is there a comment on the, um, the OSTP guidance recently about public access to publications? And just given that the NIH has been such a leader in that, and from what I've read, each institute is supposed to craft their own policy. And from the perspective of, of a researcher, I would hope that these policies will be as uniform as possible. Right? Just I, I know a lot of us are involved in, in projects and have publications where you have funding from the NIH and NSF and DARPA, et cetera. And um, I guess my hope is that you know, down the line, there will be just one manuscript submission, submission, manuscript submission system that we could use across research, no matter who funded it. So I don't know if, if other agencies are looking to the NIH or the NIH has thought about trying to give guidance to others about how to do this. So um, does anybody in the back want to stand up and help me with this one, if there is anybody? One? But I mean, this is all new to some, I mean, the exact details of the latest guidance. You know, historically, Elena, you're welcome to come. You can start. I mean, one thing I'd point out is um, I f first getting um, harmony across the NIH institutes will be a challenge, but I'm more optimistic about that compared to other agencies. I, I mean, I would think we will be looked to as leaders for that. It's, but it's, you know, whether 
they truly follow our lead is to be determined. But I know there's a lot of discussion activity. So the um, NIH is doing this NIH-wide. We'll have an, one agency plan for all of NIH. And um, because this is a broader um, scope of who the new memo applies to, uh, I have heard, I mean, again, like he said, it's early days, but I have heard that um, NIH will reach out to the smaller agencies for which this will now apply to help them in developing their policies. So hopefully more coordination across, like you mentioned. But I, you know, I, I you know, I want to be optimistic, but I think we should appreciate Every, you know, especially when these things come out from OSTP across all the government, I mean, the, the cultural differences between some of these different agencies, sometimes it's very hard to get everybody walking in lockstep. We love the folks who will just listen to lead, you know, we'll listen to what NIH is doing, and say, all right, we'll do that too, but that won't always be the case. So, Elena, you're optimistic that there'll be one NIH kind of, okay, that's good to hear. Because I, I knew there were going to be some flexibilities, but maybe they're going to rein in those flexibilities more. Good. Yeah, Peter? One sort of, this is the law of unintended consequences, but I'm wondering if NIH is considering just evaluating the effects of sort of open access. Um, and there, there's two things that are, are happening. And it did, and it, I mean, it's great to have access to papers, but um, first of all, journals are turning predatory. So I, I just got an invitation from a journal that is at least 70 years old that I, I, I studied uh, intensively in medical school and they, at, they sent me a, you know, a, a forum email to, to submit an article about a topic that I've never had anything to do with and just like, oh, okay, they've gone predatory. Well, they're Elsevier, I guess. Um, the other thing is that the costs are going up and so I think you can apply, uh, get $2,000 or something, a paper from the NIH, but now some of the good journals want 5,000. What do we do then? And so it would be interesting just to hear, you know, also about the downside of open access publishing and, and how the NIH intends to, to help us deal with that. <laughs> I, I think your points are, are good ones, and I'm going to be very curious how this shakes out, because I, these are things we clearly recognize and are hearing. And, um, uh, the devil's going to be in the details, no question. Laura Beirut, did you have a, a question or a comment? I think Olga does. I was, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to comment earlier just about um, it was difficult to hire all research staff, not just postdocs. Okay. Thank and you. so, but, you know, I, I think we're going to live with this for a while. Okay. Thank you. Olga, go ahead. Sorry, Laura, just a minor uh, addition to the last point. Uh, I think the the open access, while it's a really great thing, it, we do need to figure out how to do it on the other end. In addition to the researchers, also the, a lot of the societies are going to be majorly impacted. So we should think of uh, what to do and whether it's worth uh, having some way of helping some of the key societies who, whose revenues used to come from journals. So Following up on, on the comments from, from Peter and Olga, I mean, who is it that we should talk to about this? I mean, would it be useful to talk to, like, an editor of a journal or editors of journals or, or you know, in terms of this open access policy and, uh, you know, things? Because it's, I have a question, you know, I'm wondering, well, it's something we can complain about, but who do we talk to to try to listen. figure out who will listen what was going on i mean i can can think of you know people at you know editors of, of journals you know like uh orly bacall is, is someone that has been involved in you know nature and genetics and nature and you know, was it cell genomics but maybe you know gail did you have a comment she yes i can say shg has looked at this very hard because a lot of revenue does come from the journal and that supports a lot of programs, you know, fundamentally, someone has to pay for the system, right? And so we're shifting from a users, medical centers and libraries paying for access to the submitters paying to publish and, or giving up a very expensive peer review system. 
and an editing system, right? So we're going to either, you know, we're going to shift costs. We might cut corners depending on the journal. I'm not speaking on behalf of my society at all, but I, these are the problems that are being discussed, right? To sustain a high quality publication is expensive. Who's, who pays for it? You have an access problem now for people who don't have a medical center to access these publications, but under-resourced institutions don't have the money to pay for their authors to publish a $5,000 fee. So, you know, it's just moving around who's underserved to some extent. And I, I think it really needs to be thought about more broadly. You know, it's a great philosophy. Everything should be available to everyone. The question is who pays for that? And that's not clear right now, in my opinion. And I also think that part of it is, I mean, as on the editorial associate editors for, for journals, one of the questions that comes up is that the cost oftentimes is in the paper copy. And so, you know, is that going to, to print or not print? Right. Is that all going to go away? Yeah, I, I, I can't speak to that level of detail. I think Bruce Korf would be a great person if you wanted someone to come talk about this. He's really spent a lot of time and energy from the great. standpoint of a couple societies, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but by the way, I mean, I'd also point out, uh, I, while I completely share your concerns about these unintended consequences, this is not totally new, right? I mean, this is just a, a, an additional tightening of these requirements. These same discussions have been going at least 10 years. I mean, when, you know, the whole thing about open access started that, you know, thou shall put papers in various places that you must do. I mean, I, I've been, as many of you know, I've, I've been very involved with Cold Spring Harbor Press for many decades now. And I mean, that's a whole other model where, you know, they're not trying to make a lot of money, but it's not a professional society, but it's a big service. And they've been just scrambling, trying to figure out all. And, but of course, then they also created BioArchive, which has a whole other dynamic associated with it. So it's professional societies, it's for-profit publishers, it's not-for-profit publishers. So, but this has been discussed. This is just a additional tweaking of the equilibrium, but it's not brand new. I mean, these same issues have been bubbling along for a, over a decade. And, and I think they're gonna to continue to have to sort of settle with this new requirement. Yeah. And one more Gail. thing, which is you know, just from my own personal experience of running a research group, the papers I'm paying the most money for open access for are for my trainees, because <laughs> they're not the highest impact papers yeah. that are going to the highest journals. They're, you know, incremental papers as they learn. And, you know, I've been lucky I've been able to sustain that, but not every lab can do that. And so, you know, I think trainees may end up getting squeezed for publications if those fees have to come from somewhere because they're they're not really doing funded research a lot of the time. Yeah. Oh. Betty, did you? Wait, at a microphone, Betty. Do you? Yeah. yeah. I just sent Rudy and Eric the NHGRI funding policy for 2022. So if you could share that with council, Rudy, that Rudy will send that around. Speaks to the length of awards. Great. Um, that, that's very useful, Betty. Thank you. And one related question. I know we're just about at closing yeah. time, but uh, I, I don't think NHGRI has an R35 type funding mechanism, do they? Uh, similar to GM? We have used it. Usually, we have used it usually as program, correct me, usually as like a one year bridge. Oh, okay. No, oh, wait. Somebody step up and correct okay. me. The challenge flag just went up. All right. <laughs> that's not baseball. That's football. I know that. But the red flag. That's right. Red flag. Wait. Let's make sure we get the facts right. Oh, yeah. no. oh, oh, oh. oh. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Lisa, you're in the oh, best. No, no. He said R35. R35. Okay. Since they're five years, typically. Yeah. The R35 can actually go to eight years. Um, we did have an R35 program. We used it for early stage investigators. It was called the Genomic Innovator. Um, but you're right, most other institutes use it for more established investigators for longer term funding with like a upper limit of like $750,000 direct cost per year, up to eight years. But, but we've now chosen not to use that mechanism. And not for that. Not for not that. Not for that career stage. But we are continuing to use this mechanism for, in other ways or not? No, we don't actually have So at the program. moment, we don't have an R35 
right. opportunity. Yes. Yeah. Just, just one thing about the R35. That is an activity code that can be used in a variety of ways. So, yeah, we there used to be the old merit award, and so a lot of institutes are using that. And NHGRI did at one time participate in the merit award, but those are <laughs> grants that will really eat away at your base if you keep adding people to it. So you look up and you have very little new um, new money to make awards. So we bowed out of that. Yeah. No, I understand. And I, I should have been more specific. I was referring to the R35 mirrors. Um, Other mirrors. So, um, but I understand it's kind of a zero sum game. Take money from one place, it disappears from another. So it's the 56 that's used as the bridge? Okay, my apologies. This is certainly a long list, so uh, are there last comments? Okay, until tomorrow morning, right, we'll come back tomorrow morning. Okay, so we've got just a little bit of administrative stuff to get through. Uh, at the break, uh, Comfort passed around the uh, conflict of interest form. Please sign it. You can just leave it at your uh, table, and we'll collect them up at the end of the day today. And the last order of the business is the uh, exciting conflict of interest statement that I'm going to read. This refers to the applications that you'll review tomorrow. But we're required to read it out loud. You must leave the meeting room when applications submitted by your own organization are being individually discussed. In the case of state higher education or other systems with multiple campuses that are geographically separated, own organization is intended to mean the entire system except where a determination has been made that the, comp that the components are separate organizations for the purpose of determining conflict of interest. You should avoid situations that could give rise to charges of conflict of interest, whether real or apparent. For example, you should not participate in the deliberations and actions on any application from or involving your spouse, child, recent student, recent teacher, professional collaborator with whom you have worked closely, a close personal friend or a scientist with whom you have had longstanding scientific or personal differences. The NHTRI staff will determine the appropriate action based on recency, frequency, and strength of such associations or interest, either positive or negative, and will instruct you accordingly. In council actions in which your vote on a block of applications without discussing any individual one, for example, the on-block vote, your vote will not apply to any application from any institution fulfilling the criteria noted above. So you want to gavel us to closure, and we will see you tomorrow morning here at 11 o'clock Eastern time start for the second closed session. See you tomorrow. There should be a shuttle bus waiting to take you back. <laughs>